Story number one, I drive Uber Black in Portland, where the privacy divider and leather seats usually mean business executives and airport runs. The interior cameras are mandatory, a small red light constantly blinking in the corner of my mirror. That camera saved a life on my last shift of November. The couple emerged from Morton's Steakhouse at 10.40 p.m. He wore a charcoal suit, Italian leather shoes clicking against the wet pavement. She had on a blue cocktail dress, her wrap already soaked from the light drizzle. I noticed her hand trembling as she reached for the door handle. They sat with deliberate space between them, his jaw clenched tight enough that I could see the muscles flexing. The first ten minutes passed in rigid silence. I caught fragments of their evening through the divider. A business dinner gone wrong, clients who'd left early, drinks he shouldn't have ordered. Then his whispers started, cutting through the low hum of my engine. You embarrassed me in there. Her responses were barely audible, each one making him lean closer. My fingers tightened on the steering wheel as I maintained exactly five miles over the speed limit, watching the GPS count down our arrival time. The interstate stretched empty ahead, our only company the rhythmic flash of reflectors marking the lanes. Through the rearview mirror, I tracked his hands, how they kept flexing, forming fists, then releasing. The woman pressed herself against the door, making herself smaller with each passing mile. Her perfume couldn't mask the sharp scent of his whiskey breath. His strike came at the I-205 exit. The impact was sharp, decisive, practiced. Her head snapped against the window with enough force to make the glass vibrate. The sound of her choked gasp filled the cabin. Blood began flowing from her nose, staining the collar of her dress dark. The metallic smell filled the confined space. Three minutes from their destination, I saw metal glint in his hand. A tactical folding knife, the blade catching the glow from my dashboard displays. Four inches of serrated steel, the kind marketed to professionals but bought by men who fantasize about using them. Pull over, he said. His voice had dropped an octave, cold and flat. Right here. I chose a spot under a broken street lamp, keeping my movement smooth. Years of late night driving had taught me the danger of sudden gestures. Through the mirror, I watched him shift the knife between his hands, his knuckles white around the grip. A car passed us, slowed briefly, then continued on. We were alone on the residential street. Both of you stay still, he commanded. The woman's breathing came in short, sharp bursts. A line of blood tracked down her chin, dripping onto her dress. The camera's red light remained steady, documenting everything. My phone sat in its mount, the screen displaying our location. One wrong move and this could end with multiple police reports. Take it outside, I said, measuring each word carefully. Whatever this is between you, take it outside the car. I kept my hands visible on the wheel, acutely aware of how confined the space was, how many seconds it would take him to lunge forward. The divider suddenly felt paper thin. The moment I felt his weight shift toward the door, I accelerated. The tires caught immediately, one advantage of a luxury vehicle. In my mirror, his figure diminished rapidly, the knife still in his hand as he stood under the broken lamp. The woman's purse remained on the seat, small drops of blood marking where she'd sat. I drove straight to the county sheriff's department, less than two miles away. The deputy reviewed the footage immediately, his expression hardening as he watched. Within 20 minutes, three patrol cars were dispatched to the address. They found him still pacing in the driveway, the knife in his pocket. The footage showed everything in crisp detail. My statement took 40 minutes to record. Later that night, Uber's safety team called, their questions precise and thorough. They suspended his account permanently. The woman's statement would be taken at the hospital, where she was being treated for a broken nose, concussion, and three previous fractures that showed up on her x-rays. I've done over 4,000 rides in Portland. Now I instinctively check passengers' hands when they enter, and I keep my distance from arguing couples. That red camera light remains my constant companion, blinking steadily through the darkness. Story number two, I drive nights for Uber in the industrial district. Most pickups are factory workers or late shift employees, nothing unusual. That changed last Tuesday when I accepted a fare from the downtown area. The passenger was well-dressed, maybe 50, carrying a metal briefcase that looked too heavy for its size. He gave me an address across town, but five minutes in, he changed his mind. Take a right here, he said, his voice flat, 
Quick stop first. His reflection in my mirror showed perfect stillness. No fidgeting, no checking his phone, just that unnaturally steady gaze. Each turn led us deeper into the warehouse district. The streetlights grew farther apart, creating pools of orange light between stretches of darkness. My GPS signal weakened as the buildings grew denser, the blue dot jumping erratically before disappearing entirely. The passenger's grip on his briefcase tightened with each passing block, his knuckles white against the handle. The warehouses loomed larger now, their metal walls reflecting what little light remained. My passenger's breathing changed, short, controlled bursts that fogged the window. He kept checking his phone, but the screen never lit up. I caught glimpses of his face in my rearview mirror. Jaw clenched, eyes scanning the shadows between buildings. The silence in the car grew heavier with each passing minute. The pavement changed beneath us as we entered a service road. Instead of smooth asphalt, we rattled over concrete seams and metal plates. Every bump made the passenger clutch his briefcase closer. My hands were sweating on the steering wheel as I wondered what could be so valuable or dangerous to warrant such protection. We stopped at a warehouse with no markings except a faded 47 painted above the loading dock. Wait here, he ordered, stepping out with the briefcase. The sound of his footsteps echoed off the metal walls, then silence. I kept the engine running, watching the fuel gauge tick down minute by minute. The empty parking lot stretched out before me, scattered with debris and broken pallets. Ten minutes passed. Twenty. The only movement was shadows shifting as clouds passed over the moon. I considered calling the police, but what would I say? Nothing illegal had happened, just a passenger making a stop. Still, every instinct told me something was wrong. Through the windshield, I watched the warehouse door, straining to hear any sound from inside. When he returned, his face was different, tenser, almost rigid. He slid into the back seat without a word. Original address, he said, his voice higher than before, strained. The briefcase sat on his lap, and he kept both hands on it, watching the road intently. We drove in complete silence. At each red light, I could hear him shifting in his seat, checking all the windows. His phone buzzed once, the screen lighting up just long enough for me to glimpse a message. Delivery confirmed. He caught me watching and angled the screen away, his expression hardening. The route to his destination took us through progressively darker streets. Each intersection seemed more deserted than the last. The few pedestrians we passed looked away quickly, as if they knew better than to show interest. My passenger's breathing had become more controlled, deliberate, like someone trying to contain something. We reached another unmarked building, this one a low concrete structure with blacked out windows. Before stepping out, he turned to me. Sweat beaded on his forehead despite the cool night air. Wait here, he said, eyes locked on mine in the mirror. His tone made it clear this wasn't a suggestion. The moment he shut the door, panic overtook me. Every horror story about late-night drivers flashed through my mind. I watched him place the briefcase carefully on the curb, then reach inside his jacket. That was enough. I slammed the car into drive and floored it, tires screeching against the pavement. In my rearview mirror, I caught his face contorting with rage as he shouted something, arm raised, but I was already turning the corner. I drove for 20 minutes straight, taking random turns, checking my mirrors constantly to make sure I wasn't being followed. Only when I reached the bright lights of downtown did I finally let myself breathe. My hands were shaking so badly I had to pull over. I sat there, engine running, ready to bolt at the slightest movement nearby. After that night, I switched to day shifts. The extra money from night driving wasn't worth whatever I'd almost gotten myself into. Story number three. Saturday nights in the bar district are usually good money. Drunk college students and party hoppers tip well, and most rides end without incident. I'd done this route hundreds times, but I stopped after the two men who climbed into my back seat at 2 a.m. They stumbled out of the Blue Room, a dive bar known for its cheap shots. Both squeezed into the back, shoulders bumping as they settled in, reeking of whiskey and cigarettes. They weren't fall down drunk, just loose enough to be louder than they should. The taller one punched in an address about 20 minutes away. Their laughter filled the car. Too loud, too sharp. They traded jokes I couldn't quite follow, speaking over each other and slapping the seats. Normal enough, until the taller one pulled out a pistol. 
My hands clenched the steering wheel as he spun it casually between his fingers. Relax, he said, catching my eye in the rearview mirror. Just for fun. His smile didn't reach his eyes. His friend howled with laughter, like this was the funniest thing he'd seen all night. Remember that weekend in Colorado? The shorter one asked, wiping tears from his eyes. They both erupted in laughter again, but something in their tone made my skin crawl. Good hunting that weekend, the man with the gun replied, still spinning it. Real good hunting. Their conversation shifted to target practice stories. Each tale seemed to end with details missing, inside jokes that made them roar with laughter while my stomach tightened. The gun kept catching the streetlights, its metal surface gleaming with each spin. They were getting more animated, shoving each other, their knees banging against my seat. Change of plans, the shorter one announced suddenly, while laughing and snorting. He leaned forward, pointing between the seats at an unmarked dirt road branching into dense forest. Take that instead, I hesitated, brake lights reflecting off the trees. That's not the address you gave. New address, the one with the gun said, no longer spinning it. His laughter had stopped. Turn. The dirt road was barely wide enough for my car. Branches scraped against the windows as we crawled deeper into the darkness. My headlights caught fragments of beer cans and old fire pits, a party spot for locals. In the back, the men grew quieter, their jovial mood evaporating with each bump in the road. We reached a clearing about half a mile in. Patches of bare earth showed where bonfires had burned, surrounded by crushed beer cans and broken bottles. The men exchanged a look in my mirror that made my blood run cold. Pull up there, the shorter one pointed between the seats, and kill the lights. My hands were shaking as I switched off the engine. Darkness pressed in around us, broken only by thin moonlight filtering through the branches. They got out together, their movements suddenly coordinated despite their earlier drunkenness. Stay here, the one with the gun ordered. We'll be right back. They were already walking toward the trees, shoulder to shoulder, phone flashlight bobbing in the darkness. I watched them disappear into the forest, the gun glinting one last time before the shadows swallowed them. The silence that followed was absolute. No crickets, no distant traffic, just my own breathing and the cooling tick of the engine. Minutes stretched like hours. I debated driving away, but fear kept me frozen. What if they came back and found me gone? What if they'd memorized my license plate? Two gunshots cracked through the silence, sharp and final. Birds erupted from nearby trees. I gripped the steering wheel, heart pounding against my ribs. The forest fell silent again. Footsteps crunched through dead leaves, growing closer. A figure emerged from the darkness. Just one of them. His face was calm, almost peaceful. Dirt streaked his hands and the knees of his jeans. The gun was nowhere in sight. He took another step toward the car. I didn't wait to see more. My foot slammed the accelerator. Tires spinning in dirt and leaves. The car fishtailed before finding grip, lurching forward down the narrow road. Hey! His shout echoed behind me. I didn't look back, didn't slow down. Branches whipped against the windows as I swerved around curves, more flying than driving. The dirt road seemed twice as long going out. When I finally hit pavement, I floored it toward the city lights. I drove straight to the police station, hands trembling as I described what happened. The ride payment had gone through on the app, proof they'd been in my car. But the officers seemed unconcerned. They took my statement with the same bored expressions I'd seen them give to drunk college kids reporting stolen phones. Hours later, a patrol car checked the clearing. They found nothing but empty beer cans and old fire pits. No shell casings, no blood, no signs anyone had been there at all. I deleted the app the next morning. Story number four. It was supposed to be a quiet night, a routine pickup from a well-lit downtown bar. The man stumbled to my car, mid-thirties, tall and broad-shouldered in an expensive suit that looked like it had been worn for days. His tie hung loose around his neck, dark stains spotting the blue silk. No bag, no belongings, just the smell of sweat, whiskey, and something metallic clinging to him like a second skin. He collapsed into the back seat without a greeting his body sinking into the leather. Up close, I could see his hands were raw and red, like he'd scrubbed them too hard. A gold wedding ring glinted on his finger, 
smudged with something dark. Anywhere but here, he mumbled, waving vaguely at the windshield. His voice was raw, almost pleading. I hesitated but nodded, setting a random destination on the GPS. The first few minutes were silent, except for the engine's hum and his ragged breathing. He kept rubbing his hands together, over and over, like Lady Macbeth trying to wash away invisible stains. Then he started talking, low and slurred, like he was speaking to himself. I didn't want it to go that far, he muttered. I mean, I told her to stop. I told her, over and over, but she wouldn't listen. She never listened. I caught his reflection in the rearview mirror, head down, fingers rubbing his temples, exposing raw scratch marks along his neck. His eyes, when they met mine, were frighteningly clear for someone who smelled so strongly of alcohol. Rain started falling, light at first, then harder. The droplets caught the streetlights, creating shifting shadows across his face. He pressed his forehead against the window, breath fogging the glass. His phone kept buzzing in his pocket, but he ignored it, fingers tapping an irregular rhythm on his knee. You know what it's like to see someone's face when they realize they're done. His voice cracked, followed by a harsh laugh that made me flinch. First, it's shock. Their eyes get so wide like they can't believe what's happening. Then panic sets in. They try to speak, but nothing comes out right. And then... He exhaled sharply, running a hand over his jaw. Then they go still, just like that, like a switch being flipped. My knuckles went white on the steering wheel. This had to be drunk talk. Had to be. But his voice carried too much detail, too much weight. He described what happened next in disturbing detail, his voice shifting between guilt and something darker, almost proud. How she fell. How still she became. How he cleaned up afterward methodically describing each step like reciting a recipe. We stopped at a red light, silence pressing in. He chuckled softly, the sound making my skin crawl. A police car cruised past, lights off, just another vehicle in the night. I watched him in the mirror. He didn't flinch, didn't tense, just followed it with those unnaturally clear eyes, like a predator tracking prey. The casual confidence in his posture made my stomach turn. You probably think I'm a monster, he said conversationally, loosening his tie further. But she wasn't innocent. She wasn't. His voice darkened, and I watched him pull something from his pocket, a rose gold iPhone with a cracked screen. Look at these messages. Look what she was planning. She would have taken everything. He tossed the phone onto the center console. I didn't dare touch it. Nobody's innocent. Not really. The GPS chimed. We'd reached the random address, an empty lot on the edge of town. He leaned forward, clapping my shoulder. His hand felt like a brand through my shirt, and I could see his cuff was soaked dark with what couldn't be water. Thanks for listening, he said, sliding out. The phone stayed on my console. He stood for a moment, silhouetted against the streetlight, straightening his tie. You should delete this ride from your history, he added quietly. Then he vanished into the shadows between buildings. I sat there, door still open, that metallic smell lingering. The sour taste of fear rose in my throat as I replayed his story in my mind. Had he made it all up? Some sick drunk's idea of a joke? But I couldn't shake the image of those clear eyes in my rearview mirror, the dried blood under his nails, the way his voice changed when he described her twitching body. Some details you can't fake, some things you have to live through to describe that well. I thought about driving to the police station, but what would I even say? I didn't know his name, his address, anything useful. Just the ramblings of a man who might be a murderer or might just be a drunk with a twisted imagination. And if he was a killer, he knew my car, my face, my license plate. My hands trembled on the wheel as I drove away, and I realized I'd never know for sure. Story number five. The ride request came in just after 11 p.m., an hour to a neighboring city. I hesitated considering the late hour, but the payout was good, and I figured the quiet highway would make for an easy drive. As a female driver, I usually avoided late-night rides, but this one seemed straightforward enough. The passenger's profile showed Daniel with a blurry photo, just some guy in a baseball cap, face partially shadowed. I didn't think much of it. Plenty of riders used unclear photos. 
But when I pulled up to the coffee shop at the edge of suburbia, a clean-shaven man in his 40s approached, carrying a small duffel bag. He was tall, well-dressed in dark clothes that looked expensive but worn. I double-checked the app. Daniel, I asked through a crack in the window. He smiled, nodding. That's me. Thanks for picking me up this late. His eyes lingered a moment too long on my face. His voice seemed pleasant enough, so I unlocked the doors. He settled into the back seat with a soft sigh, the leather creaking under his weight. You're my lucky find for the night, he said, buckling up. Not a lot of drivers willing to go this far, especially not pretty ones like you. I gave a tight smile in response, already regretting accepting the ride. The photo discrepancy nagged at me. This man looked nothing like the profile picture. Older, different build entirely. I brushed it off as outdated or bad lighting, but something felt off. At first, he made normal small talk. Work, weather, traffic. Then about ten minutes in, something changed in his voice. You really know your way around, he said, leaning forward. His eyes found mine in the rearview mirror. Bet you live nearby. You probably know all the back roads. I like your hair, by the way. That color really suits you. Natural Auburn, isn't it? I stiffened. I dyed my hair red just last week. Thanks, I said curtly, keeping my eyes on the road. Yeah, I figured you were a redhead now, he chuckled. Bet you've got a cozy little place around here. Something tucked away, not far from the city, but private. You seem like the type. Single woman, independent. Probably like your space. My stomach nodded. Strange assumption, but I told myself he was just being awkward. Not really, I said vaguely. I mostly just drive to make ends meet. He pressed on. Nah, I can tell. I bet it's one of those cute apartments. Maybe a balcony with a couple of plants? Those purple flowers you water every morning? Soft lighting? Nice curtains? Cream-colored, right? Feels like home. My hands tightened on the wheel. His description was uncomfortably accurate down to my morning watering routine. I forced a laugh. You're a good guesser. You think so? His voice stayed light. I just notice things. People, mostly. You can tell a lot by the way they talk, by the way they move, like how you always check your blind spot twice, or how you tap your fingers on the wheel when you're nervous, like you're doing right now. I consciously stilled my fingers, fear crawling up my spine. The GPS guided us onto the highway. Forty-five minutes left. I weighed my options. He hadn't done anything overtly threatening, just this unsettling mix of observant and familiar. I decided to stay calm and keep driving. You must meet all kinds of people doing this, he said, leaning back. Bet you have some stories. Weird ones. Creepy ones, maybe. Pretty girl like you, working alone at night. Must get some interesting offers. Sometimes, I admitted cautiously but most people are pretty normal. He grinned faintly. Yeah? You think I'm normal? I didn't answer. The silence hung there before he leaned forward again, voice lower. I feel like I know you, like I've seen you before. You've been driving this route a lot, haven't you? Always in that blue tank top when it's warm, the one with the small tear in the back. My pulse quickened. I'd worn that shirt last week. No, not really. I said quickly, fighting to keep my voice steady. His soft chuckle made my skin crawl. Sure you have. I mean, I've seen you. Maybe not here, but... Somewhere. I don't forget faces. Especially not one like yours. Ten miles to the exit. I focused on the road, but my mind raced. That profile photo haunted me now. Nothing like the man behind me. I thought about pulling into a rest stop, but we were surrounded by empty highway. No safe places to stop. You've got a nice routine, don't you? He said suddenly. Driving this late, heading home around, what, midnight? Maybe one? Park in that covered spot behind your building. Take the stairs because the elevator makes you nervous. Bet there's no one waiting for you when you get there. No boyfriend, no roommate. Just you and those little succulents on your windowsill. I said nothing, bile rising in my throat. The highway signs blurred past as my grip tightened. You should be careful, though, he continued, casual, but with an edge that chilled me. You let anyone in this car. Not everyone's nice, you know, and not everyone just watches. The motel finally appeared, run down, edges of town. Relief flooded through me. 
As I pulled in, he leaned forward one last time, close enough that I could smell his cologne. You've been great company, he smiled faintly. Thanks for the ride. Oh, and... His voice dropped. I really like your balcony. Those new wind chimes you hung up yesterday. They make such a pretty sound at night. My breath caught, but he was already out, duffel bag over his shoulder. One last smile, then he vanished into the dark parking lot. I sat there shaking, staring at the app's timer, at that blurry photo of Daniel. I reported him immediately, uploaded a screenshot of his comments, detailed everything he'd said about my home. The app sent back a generic response about investigating the incident. I drove home that night taking a different route, checking my mirrors constantly. I kept seeing his face in every shadow, his knowing smile in every reflection. The next day, I took down my wind chimes, closed my curtains, and parked my car on a different street. But I couldn't shake the feeling that somewhere, in some parked car or dark corner, he was still watching, still noticing, still knowing exactly where to find me. A week later, all I got was an automated message saying they couldn't verify my claims.